Hi, everybody. Welcome to the North Dakota State University Spring Fever Garden Forums, where we connect you, the gardener, with the researchers at NDSU. My name is Tom Kolb. I'm an extension horticulturist in the Department of Plant Sciences. And tonight I'm joined with Bob Birch, a web technology specialist in the Department of Agriculture Communications. This is the third of our four forums this spring, and tonight our theme is going to be trees and shrubs. And just as a note, all the handouts for tonight's forum are posted now on the Spring Fever website. The format that we use tonight will be the one we always use. We start with a 20 to 25 minute presentation, followed by about 10 to 15 minutes of your questions. And we do invite your participation in the forums. And as Bob described, if you have a question, just click on that purple tab in the lower right hand corner, and that will open up a chat box. Type in your question, hit the enter key, and that question will come to me, and then I'll do my best to get as many questions as possible answered. Okay, let's get started. Are you doing a good job taking care of your trees in your yard? Here to tell us the do's and don'ts of tree care is Joe Zlesnick, an extension forester. Joe, welcome to the forum. Okay, well, thank you, Tom. And as we get this going, uh, I want to say welcome to everybody. How many folks do we have tonight? Uh, or over 500. Over 500. Well, that's great. Okay. Well, when we first talked about this program tonight, my part of it, uh, this was the title I came up with, Tree Maintenance, Spring and Summer, which could go on for hours. And I have to say, I didn't really like that title a whole lot. Uh, it just wasn't, it, it was too much. So I came up with this one. We're going to go trees month by month. This is more of the things you need to do on a regular basis throughout the course of the year. So what we're seeing right now, March and April, uh, we are in April, I called it March earlier today, and I was corrected, is we're seeing winter injury on conifers. This is a ponderosa pine tree, actually in my own yard, uh, about a month ago, about a month ago. And you notice there's kind of orange golden tips on some of those needles. As we look a little closer, you can see them a little more clearly. They actually tended to be on the south side of the tree. Uh, I've seen other trees where they are on the south side. I've seen other trees where they're all the way around. Uh, golden tips like this, golden branches. There's a, not branches, excuse me, needles. And there's a, a close up. Winter injury is a, a very broad category. There's lots of different things that can cause winter injury. The extreme cold, the, the sun, the wind, uh, it can get dry, it can get cold, it can get warm again, varying temperatures. Here's an Austrian pine on the NDSU campus from several years ago. You know, this one, I think it's pretty clear there was an area that was protected by the deep snow, whereas uh, above that it wasn't protected. Looking a little closer, we can see, well, a few weeks later, about three or four weeks later than that first picture, hey, new growth is starting to occur, and that's good. Well, new growth is starting to occur on some of the branches, but not others. Those others in the black, with the black arrows, those are dead. Those buds died. They, they didn't survive. So I have to say that tree is no longer there. Uh, it just wasn't hardy enough or... Something killed it, some type of winter injury. Uh, sometimes winter injury, it hits other conifers as well. Spruce trees, junipers in the example here, arborvitae can be along a sidewalk where, who knows, maybe that sidewalk where the junipers were or the arborvitae, that was cleared of snow and those were exposed. Uh, maybe there was a little bit of salt that was used there. It's hard to say. Regardless, there's not a whole lot that can be done about winter injury other than sit and wait. Hate to say it, uh, but that's really all, about all we can do at this point. See what happens. Hope for the best. The other thing that I see a lot at this time of the year is damage from rabbits, uh, voles, mice, sometimes deer, and uh, they really love fruit trees. Um, I have to say I, I'm not a big fan of rabbits. I have an ongoing battle against them. This was outside of my old church several years ago in West Fargo. Uh, the church spent a lot of money on these trees. And the rabbits, I, I think these might have been jackrabbits, did a number on them. Uh, it was very sad to see because basically those trees were, were done. They were girdled all the way around when they lose the bark like that. Um, yeah, prune here. 
uh, if you want any kind of tree to come back. Uh, everything above that is going to die. There might, there will probably be sprouts coming out about there. Uh, on this example, uh, sometimes it's pruned, it's girdled all the way to the ground, so pruning won't do anything. Uh, you could start over, you could plant a new tree, but still it's going to need protection in the future. So if it's a grafted tree, let's say you've got your your Honeycrisp apple grafted onto a, a rootstock like Dolgo crab apple, which is very hardy. Is it going to come back as the Dolo crab apple? It really depends where the graft was. If the graft is in that living tissue below below that dead area, then the graft, the desired graft, might come back. Okay, you might get your honey crisp back. Uh, there's no guarantee. But if it's whoops, sorry. But if it's above that point, um, it's not going to come back. You're just going to get suckers from the root system. So. Again, know where the graft is, and I should have put in a photo of a graft, uh, graft union. Look up graft union, Google it. Uh, that should show you what a graft will look like. Here's some damage on arborvitae. The deer love, Ar love arborvitae. This was in North Moorhead, I think 97. Uh, boy, those trees really took it hard. Are these trees going to survive? Maybe. Actually, they were there a couple years later, so they did survive, but boy, were they stressed. That's a lot of needles to lose. So, okay, after the damage from rabbits and rodents, uh, maybe you were fortunate enough to put on tree wrap or other type of protection. Time to take that off. Okay, this is an apple tree in my own yard. I put, I put pipe on that stem i put pipe on some of the lower branches and uh, it seems to work okay uh, i'm probably going to need to do this every winter for the next several years because that tree is still small diameter and, and the rabbits really like it here's an example from newtown north dakota several years ago boy they left that tree wrap on too long uh, it was really causing some damage to that tree I think the tree survived. It recovered, um, although the rock mulch is a little tough on the tree. Um, but this is a case where they should have taken that tree wrap off a lot earlier. I think they left this on year round. And at the bottom of the stem, you can see that there's some mold growing. So we want to try to avoid that. So remove the tree wrap and any other protection you have. Okay. And finish pruning. Uh, people say, isn't it too late to prune? Well, eh, it's a little late, but you know what? You can go out there and do it now and just get it done next week or two. That'd be good. We do have a publication, Basic Guidelines for Pruning Trees and Shrubs. Uh, if you look that up, there, there's a link right there. I don't think they'll be able to access the link on the PowerPoint. But um, if you looked up NDSU extension H1036, that would get you to the document. So that was it, March and April. How about May? You know, in May, it's time to plant trees. Uh, that's when the soil conservation districts are going. Can you plant trees right now? Well, actually, yeah. Anytime you can dig and you're not hitting frost, you can plant trees. Uh, tree roots will grow anytime the soil temperature is above 40 degrees. So I just want to uh, emphasize as far as planting goes, Location, location, location. Just like a wise investment. There are good locations and bad locations. This was a bad location to put an elm tree right under the power line. Uh, try to avoid that if you can. Look overhead, look around, see what's nearby. We, we don't want to cause conflicts with infrastructure. In the foreground of this photo, there are a couple new trees planted. I'm pretty sure those are crab apples or plums, something that's fairly short. The other thing, here's another example. Uh, this was from South Fargo from last year. Boy, is that harbor fighting awfully close. And I'm not talking the one in the foreground, I'm talking that, that straight spire in the back corner of the house and the one beyond that. We'll take another look here. Here's another angle. That straight spire on the right side of the screen, yeah, it's against the siding, it's into the roof. It had to go around the roof. Uh, the one on the side, the, the bigger one closer in the foreground, that's up against the siding too. 
one thing we rarely do is look to see what is the mature size of the tree. And that's kind of important because this can happen. There are a lot of different cultivars of, Ar of Arborvitae. Some are bigger than others. Uh, Juniper is the same thing. Some are more columnar, some are more broad spreading. So it's going to vary from uh, tree to tree. Look, look that up when you're planting trees and keep that in mind. It's okay, so a location, location, location. And we do have a uh, planting publication. Look up F1785, tree planting in North Dakota. That'll give you some uh, broad tips, <laughs> more than just green side up. That's one of our, our favorite tips, green side up. Uh, goes beyond that a little more. Actually goes a lot more than that. Um, one of the questions I get starting this time of year, I got two of them today, is about needle cast disease. And needle cast is a, a, a disease on spruce trees. Usually we see it more in the eastern part of the state. And, oh, I didn't put the publication up for this one. Uh, one thing about needle cast is it's it can be controlled by fungicides. And the first application usually happens towards the end of May. About the same time that spruce trees, uh, their needles are about half elongated. So keep that in mind uh, towards the end of May. It, usually that's around the end of May, uh, roughly around uh, Memorial Day. Uh, in June, oh, it's warm now, we've got our trees planted. What happens in June? In June, I start to get phone calls and emails, lots of them, several every day. Uh, regarding what's wrong with my tree and there's a lot of things that can go wrong with trees there are a lot of insect pests that show up there are some uh, disease pests fungal diseases and this is when they're most often observed and quite frankly I could go on for hours just on pests so I'll, I'll just say observe and note what's going on and another thing I will say Defoliation or other leaf damage is not a problem if there's less than about 30% loss. This is very interesting to me that, you know, trees are a little redundant. They have more tissue than they really need. Uh, that's not, if, it's not a bad thing, but they kind of uh, are playing for a loss. That is, they expect insects to come along. They expect windstorms to happen. They expect diseases. And they can handle a bit of defoliation. So if there's a little bit of damage on the, the leaves, quite frankly, it's, it's not, not anything to worry about. So just keep an eye on that. Keep that in mind. So that's June and July. Uh, sorry, <laughs> staying in June. All right. In June, uh, there's a second application of fungicide that's needed to prevent needle cast. And usually that's about three to four four weeks later than the uh, than that May application. Uh, it depends on which product you're using, so make sure you follow the label directions. But this is another thing that often needs to be done in June. Water and fertilizer, don't overdo it. One of the questions we often get is how much uh, fertilizer do my trees need? What's the best fertilizer? And you know what? Uh, my my smart aleck answer, and I apologize for being a smart aleck, is the best fertilizer is water. Um, generally, our soils are fine in North Dakota. Generally, our soils have plenty of nutrients. The most limiting factor of trees is water because of our, uh, the tendency we have to get dry, to get into drought. That being said, don't overwater either. Uh, Trees need water, but they don't need it every day or twice a day or three times a day. Once a week is sometimes even too much. Uh, what I recommend now, a newer tree, first month, yeah, maybe once a week. Uh, second month, maybe once every other week. Uh, after that, I, I tend to just cut back on watering. I, I like to be hard on trees. I like that to make them forage on their site, live on their site without a whole lot of help from me. Because they're going to be there a lot longer than I am. Okay. Uh, summer, you can actually prune in the summer. Uh, we do recommend avoiding these different species because of insect and disease problems. For elm trees, we're trying to avoid creating wounds on elm trees in the summer because wounded elm trees attract bark beetles. 
and bark beetles are what carry Dutch elm disease. So we're trying to avoid that if you can. And sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Um, honey locust trees, there's a fungal problem with those. Oak trees, uh, the issue there is a problem called oak wilt, which we haven't really found in North Dakota yet, but it can be a problem. So we try to avoid wounding oak trees in the summer. And then the bottom group, apples, hawthorns, juneberries, anything in the rose family. Uh, these are the species that can get fire blight. Fire blight is actually a bacterial problem, uh, but we try to avoid wounding these in the summer if we can. If there's storm damage, obviously you do what you got to do. All right. So moving on to July, happy 4th of July, happy Independence Day. Keep your eye out on pests. Um, my calls start to taper off at this point. And I will say, we recommend not fertilizing from roughly July 4th onward. Uh, well, maybe by mid-September you could start again. Why do we recommend this? Because actually it's all about winter. Think winter in July? Well, uh, what we're thinking here is that if trees are growing so fast into the fall, they're, they're fully healthy, a lot of vegetative tissue, a lot of tender tissue, they don't harden up for winter. So our recommendation is to stop fertilizing uh, once you get into July. And related to that, in August, cut way back on watering. I Again, it's the same thing. We don't want trees to go into winter. Uh, well, sorry, we don't want the, them to go into fall too vigorous and growing. The way that trees respond to drought is very similar to the way uh, physiologically they start to kick in for winter hardiness. The two mechanisms are related. So we recommend cutting way back on watering. You know, um, we planted a tree for my mother-in-law years ago, an autumn blaze maple. Uh, for better or worse, it's a good tree, it's a bad tree. For better or worse, uh, she wanted an autumn blaze, so we planted it for her. And it never would color up for her. And I finally realized they had a sprinkler system in their yard. They were watering constantly. So that tree was growing and growing and growing late into the fall. It never really hardened up like it should. Never really colored up either. Uh, since then, years ago, uh, my mother-in-law has since left us. Uh, my wife and I live in that house now. And let me tell you, we cut back on watering. We turn off the, the sprinkler system in August. And now the autumn blaze does color up. It's still a little late, but uh, it does color up. And it hardens up for winter. That's really the most important thing. So, oh, there it is. Why, why do I recommend this? It's because of the droughts, drought stress response. So that's August. Wow, the year is going fast. Uh, September. What is I want to start singing Calendar Girl. No. Calendar tree? No. Okay. In September, we start watering again around mid-month. Uh, start fertilizing again around mid-month if that's something you want to do. Again, our soils are usually pretty darn good, and they don't need fertilizer. Um, fall planting. Can you plant trees in the fall? Yes, absolutely. Actually, you can plant trees year-round. Well, sorry. You can plant trees all summer long. Let me, let me rephrase that. Sorry. Um, but fall is a good time to plant as well. And among other things, uh, this is a, a rough recommendation of when you want to have your trees in the ground by timeline. And this is ideal. I got the ideal highlighted there in the, the figure title. The reason, first of all, we have the, the, this, uh, this figure here is it's all about soil temperature. We want to get the trees in the ground about a month before the soil temperature drops to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, obviously, I can't predict that. You can't predict that. Nobody can predict that. But there's a lot of information available from the North Dakota Ag Weather Network, the NDON system. Okay, and from that data, we were able to pull out what time does the soil temperature on average get to 40 degrees. 
and it's one month after each of these dates, about four weeks after each of these dates. So ideally up in the northwest part of the state, you'd want to have trees in by mid-September. Um, you know, in the southeast, you got till October 1st. There's actually quite a, a broad gap there, quite a span of time. So this is ideal if you happen to get something in in the northwest on September 17th. Is the tree doomed to fail? No, no. This is an average. Uh, this is an estimate. Everything's an estimate. Uh, so this, this is just a recommendation. You can go beyond that, absolutely. Um, and best wishes. Hope it works. Okay, so that's fall planting. As we get into October, uh, one of the things we, we've started to water again, one of the things that we try to do is actually water conifers in before winter arrives and give them a good thorough soaking. Uh, don't drown them, but make sure that they're, they're fully hydrated going into winter. One of the causes of winter injury can be that trees are kind of dry and uh, they get a nice warm day in the middle of winter and they go to do photosynthesis and they lose moisture from their leaves, their needles, but they can't replace it because the ground is frozen. So we try to get them going into winter uh, a little more hydrated. Is it a perfect solution? No, but it certainly helps. It certainly does help. So that's what we're trying to avoid. Okay. Oh, and then get to October, we also want to protect the trees from rabbits and deer. So that's time to, you know, we, we got to keep this in mind. We usually don't think about it in October, but that's when we have to start doing this. That uh, tree that I had the pipes on earlier in its life, I had a fence around it because I just didn't want the rabbits to hit it or the deer. And so far, so good. Knock on wood. Uh, we'll see how my wife bought me that tree. Okay. That's that tree now. Rake up and destroy diseased leaves. You know, it's very interesting. A lot of the foliar diseases of trees, the, the way that fungus will overwinter is in the dead leaves that are on the ground. So if we can get rid of those, this is a good time to do that. We can get rid of those diseased leaves, then that might reduce the, the problems the following year. So fall cleanup, this is a good thing to do. And come November, time to start pruning again. Uh, it's interesting. You, you look at the, the cities in North Dakota. When do they start pruning? They start pruning on November 1st. Now, maybe November 15th. But they're trying to avoid, again, things like spreading Dutch elm disease, attracting elm bark beetles. But winter is a great time to prune. And with that, I think, kind of flew through that. but. Be happy to take your questions. That draws a quick year. We welcome, we welcome people's questions. Here's one, Joel. Uh, what's best for winter protection? Tree wrap or that white drain tile? Or should you use both? I don't think you need both. Uh, either one will work well. Uh, whatever fits your, your budget, whatever fits your situation. The point is keep the... Uh, keep the bark covered so that the rabbits or voles or mice or whatever can't get to it. I've seen plastic pipe do a great job, except where that seam was split, you know, uh, because that's where the rabbits could get in there because the pipe wasn't big enough. Uh, I've seen similar things with that tree wrap. So either will work just fine. Just make sure that you got good coverage. Okay. Can somebody compost diseased leaves? Yes, you can. Uh, boy, good composting, though. You need to get the, the temperature of that compost up really hot. Uh, bacteria and probably fungi will be killed at about 160 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's pretty hot. So you need to get that up to a really high temperature. Okay, question about uh, vole damage on plums. Mm. It was a pipe stone and toke up plums were curdled by voles. Will the trees sucker? And if they do, will the suckers be the same as a desired plum cultivar? Well, um, the tree will likely sucker, but yeah, the question is, were they grafted? Uh, it's, it's hard to say because 
Usually trees like that are grafted. Uh, however, sometimes trees are on their own roots. So you really have to check your, your own tree. That apple tree of mine that I've got so well protected, it's actually not grafted. It's a, what is it? It's a frostbite apple that was uh, propagated by, on its own root system. So it's not grafted. So that's a different situation. You'll have to check your plum. Chances are it is grafted, in which case it would probably, and chances are it was grafted above where the damage was. So um, chances are the suckers will be a, a wild type plum or not the desired. You have to see where the suckers come from, below yep. the graft or above the graft. Right. Right. Joe, how long can evergreens stand in water? Uh, evergreens are generally, <laughs> that's a great question for this time of year. Uh, evergreens are generally not flood tolerant. Uh, they really have a hard time with flooding. However, right now, if they're dormant, doesn't matter. If they're dormant, they can withstand the flooding. Uh, there's still a lot of evergreens within that uh, floodplain of the Red River right now, even since the 97 flood and the 2005 flood and the 2010 flood and, uh, and all those. If the tree's dormant, it should be fine. If they are flooded, uh, it doesn't take much, you know, maybe a week, two at the most, before they start to feel it really bad. Uh, there's, in Minot, where they had that, uh, flood in 2011, uh, or in Bismarck in 2011 as well, um, those areas that were flooded have hardly any conifers left. They were mostly killed. So uh, how low would you keep the top of the fruit trees pruned for the best and easiest harvesting? Uh, I would defer that question to Tom. Uh, how low would you go, Tom? Well, for the best harvesting? <laughs> I keep it at nine feet so I can go to get on a ladder. But actually, I think about 12 to no more than 15 feet okay. is good ballpark. Okay. Uh, good. Joe, how about uh, somebody is a fan of that yellow paint that you use on as uh, on the pruning sites, mm -hmm. those happy faces? Yes. Is that recommended, Joe? Is that actually, tree really smiling or is, it, or is it sad that it was done? <laughs> You know, uh, my guess is that that was latex paint. I don't know for sure. I don't know who, who painted that. Uh, I know it was 2003 or earlier, and it, it was touched up in the last 15 years as well. Um, no, actually, we don't recommend latex paint or, or other pruning uh, wound treatments. There is a if you if you look at the research, there's very little research that supports their use. Um, if you prune at the proper time of year, you make proper pruning cuts. Uh, you're going to minimize you're going to minimize uh, chances where insects and diseases will get in and rot will start in that tree. That tree, that example, that's a cottonwood tree. The south side of I-94 at uh, Oh, mile marker 222, roughly. Uh, there's a rest area there. And I've been taking photos there every year since 2003. And that uh, that wound is healing over, but it's all rotten behind it or starting to rot behind it. So, no, I don't recommend that. Okay, Joe, you talked about how evergreens uh, struggle under flooded conditions. Mm -hmm. Can you give some general comments about deciduous trees, including fruit trees, and how they're flooding? And maybe is there a publication you could recommend? Oh, sure. Yeah, there. It's a little more variable with uh, deciduous trees. Actually, fruit trees uh, are some of the more sensitive to flooding. Uh, I want to say more than about four weeks of flooding, and they're they're really stressed. Uh, something like a green ash or an American linden or box elder that's uh, adapted to that type of habitat, you know, they can they can take the flooding and be less stressed at that time. Uh, we do have an extension publication on uh, helping flooded trees, and uh, hopefully we can get a link to that uh, publication for you. Of course, Google will have that. Yes. Just Google that, you can <laughs> find it. And we'll get uh, uh, recommendations on shade trees. Todd, our next speaker will be great for this. 
Joe, are you making a uh, maple syrup this spring? <laughs> How did we get that question? Wow. What does that have to do with anything? I wish I was making maple syrup this spring. This would have been a great spring. The way we, that melt with snow was slow, where we had cold nights, uh, below freezing, warm days above freezing. Uh, I bet there was a good maple flow this year. Uh, sugar maple trees generally don't do well in North Dakota, or they do okay. Uh, box elder trees, which are native and are a maple, actually have nearly as much sugar as a sugar maple. So if you're making maple, if you're making box elder maple syrup, I would imagine this was a great year for it. So do you recommend people tapping their maple trees for maple syrup, Joe? You're not going to get maple syrup any other way, <laughs> unless you go buy it at the store. Uh, How the trees you know, feel about that? You know, people sometimes wonder, are you you hurting the tree? You know, you are, you're creating a wound. You're drilling into it. The sap that's coming out of it, the liquid is, well, it's, it's sugar water, essentially. And you are taking some sugar, some stored energy from the tree. So there are recommendations uh, on how big a tree to tap, how many taps per tree. Um, you know, you don't want to overstress the tree. But again, trees are a bit redundant and they can take a little bit of damage. So people have been tapping the same trees for years. Uh, if you do it right, it's not going to hurt the tree. Okay, Joe. Um, this person in Stark Billings County has pine needles that show gray on the needles. Mm -hmm. Is this caused by high salt water? It's salty uh, water. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I would need to know more about the situation. Specifically, is it just showed up this time of year or is it there year round? Uh, one thing I have seen with salt, salty water that's used in irrigation is, uh, I don't know if the, well, maybe the needles turned a little brown. The tips will turn, the tips will burn, and that burn will be worse on older needles. You know, there's a, a this year's growth, last year's growth, two years ago growth, and those older needles will have a lot more of the needle tips burned than the newer needles if it's salt damage. I saw that on ponderosa pine. Some people, I guess, could be gray. I've seen it more as brown, but I think uh, sometimes color is uh, more of the, the eye of the beholder. Right, so anybody can take a photo of that, a digital photo of that, and send it to Joe, and he can give you his expert analysis. Um, Joe, how recent is the latest NDSU spruce needle cast publication? And is there a new one coming? <laughs> wow. Who I'm asked that question? I don't know. Someone just wants to give you a hard time. <laughs> I think I know who asked that question. Yes, you do. Uh, they <laughs> Well, Jim, <laughs> Good guess. Uh, the publication is a few years old. We're still working on getting the uh, new, the updated version of that out. It's about five years old. Um, we hope to get that new one out within the next month or two. Great. Uh, Joe, there's a lot of worry about needle cast being uh, displayed here. Uh, can it be stopped and the tree recover? Oh, boy. That's... It's hard. It's hard to say yes. Um, it can be controlled. Uh, the tree. It, it can be controlled to the point where the tree will be healthy. There are two different types of needle cast. There's one called Rhizosphera, and there's one called Stigmina. And it seems like Stigmina is actually the more common one now. And it's actually the tougher one, tougher to control. Uh, it. It's yeah. It takes a lot more. Uh, it takes a lot more fungicide applications to keep it under control. Not only more in any given year, but more years in a row. And it can keep the, uh, it seems like those fungicide applications can keep the disease under control, but it's nearly impossible to totally eradicate it. Okay, Joe, um, <clears throat> what sort of fungicide would be good to paint on an apple tree after pruning? I personally don't recommend any, but I don't know. Maybe you do, Tom. You're, no, I, I you know agree. a lot. I agree with your earlier statement <laughs> okay. that there's no need for wound dressings and no orchard would use a wound dressing on a pruning wound. Um, okay, we're going to just we're, we're gonna shut this down just a couple minutes. How to prevent brown spots on apple leaves. 
Sounds like scab disease. Sounds like apple scab. Potentially um, black rot or a frog eye leaf spot. This is Dutzman County. There's, oh boy. Um, there is a, a series of fungicide applications that could be uh, applied early in the growing season. And it's pretty intense. And I think there's a total of four of them. Um, it, again, I'll defer to you. You're the, the apple okay. expert. Well, I'll just say what Joe mentioned first for scab disease makes a big difference as far as raking underneath the tree because most scab disease comes from beneath the tree, beneath the tree canopy. So you can make a huge difference just by raking or nothing else, mowing underneath the tree um, to get to, for sanitation purposes. And then, like Joe indicated, uh, sprays. You, if you want to, you can use a series of sprays. The key time to start spraying is as soon as you see bud break and let's say a spray every uh, seven to ten days. You want to spray before rain so that the fungicide provides a shield of protection against the infection. Um, cap tan, mankle zeb, or sulfur is often used. I just think Three spray, and also don't forget about pruning, like Joe mentioned. Pruning makes a huge difference as far as getting more airflow and sunlight in the canopy. That makes a huge difference as far as minimizing foliar diseases. Um, okay, I think we're going to shut it down right there. I see uh, some questions that maybe Todd, our next speaker, can address, and we'll do it then. So let's take a five-minute break, and we're going to move on to learn about some recommended trees. Thank you, Joe. Thank you.